Uh, so you, you mentioned um, sort of group activities. Can can you talk a little more about that? You know, what sort of, you know, how do you, uh, well, I guess maybe to give more context, maybe, you know, sort of the class setup and size um, for one of these examples, and then maybe sort of the activities you would run, and then, you know, uh, how would you structure the time for a lecture or a lab or something like that? And, and what sort of things do you do to try to um, keep people active if you're doing group activities or what size groups? And, you know, I'm just curious about those sorts of uh, details. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So one of the things that I've always been a big fan of is working around learning goals and that attempt to have a very clearly articulated distillation of what are the various pieces that you are trying to to teach students. And from there I structure a lot of my, I mean, I, I broad stroke structure the different units that we're covering and then within those units I structure the individual tasks. And I spend a lot of time dissecting the things that, that we would do in computer science or, or anywhere. I mean, I, I teach, these days I teach a lot of, of video game design and development, so I do comparable things for, for those tasks as well. But being able to break those things up into kind of cognitive units, the things that you really need to understand foundationally and then to build upon that foundation to have a sufficient sort of cognitive matrix in place to support the things that you're adding on on top. And I spend time looking for trying to figure out how to detect when a student hasn't grasped that. Like, when are they really missing some of those foundational things? Because in my early years of teaching, I would find myself often in, in situations where I had, for whatever reason, assumed that students were further along than they actually were. And when it came time to, to test that or to, to, you know, build on that concept, things would start falling apart and I couldn't figure out why and that sort of blindness and figure out where the holes were in the understanding led me to, to keep breaking things up into smaller and smaller units. And as I did that, it forced me to really look at what the core of these things were and I was able to build activities on on top of that. You know, they were, were sort of these solid little things that would help me, even if they were imperfect, but at the very least would help me start to figure out where students were on, on the whole. And it also, by extension, gave me an opportunity when I was doing these as in-class activities, which is typically what I would do, it gave me a chance to break up the lecture so it stayed more interesting, so we could talk a little bit about something. I could, you know, put a problem out there or otherwise ground what we were about to talk about, and uh, provide an activity where they, they uh, puttered around with some of these ideas, but they would be small enough units that we could do them in short stints. And then I could bring the class back together, we could talk about that, any questions, etc. I could maybe do an example on, on, on the board and we could continue to iterate uh, while building up on this, on this foundation. It was interesting because when I first started doing this, and I, and I know these kinds of concerns have been echoed throughout the, the literature and a lot of my, my colleagues in the past have expressed similar concerns, is it sounds like, oh my gosh, we're just going to spend so much time on all of this. And yeah, it's a lot of work to set it up from the educational uh, standpoint, you know, especially if it's a new prep, it's going to take a long time. You can keep reusing these exercises. It's not like, you know, linked lists and hash tables and all these things are going out of style. I mean, these are exercises that continue to get refined and, and they, they improve with time as opposed to having to redo them constantly. But it actually, it, you know, it wasn't that it ended up taking so much time in the classroom. It just bought you a ton of time when it came to time reviewing, it bought me a ton of time when it came to people coming to my office. When they came to my office, it was no longer, I'm stuck, I don't know what I'm doing. It was, I don't get this, this, this specific thing, you did this thing in class, and well, I don't really get the rest of it either, but this foundational piece, and you know, if I could, if in a, a you know, a half an hour with the student, we could really solidly uh, nail that piece, then oftentimes the other pieces would just fall on top. You know, it was a lot easier to point to the broken chain in this this longer chain of knowledge by by structuring things this way. So it's worked really, really well. Not everything lends itself to this kind of analysis, or maybe it's, it's just me and I don't know how to break it up that way, and, and somebody else will come along and be like, oh, you should do it this way. But certainly wherever it's been possible, I've tried to break things up in that in that manner, and it's worked really, really well. 